Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. All right. If you would join us in Isaiah chapter 7. Today is the first Sunday of our Advent season. And we'll be reading from Isaiah 7, starting in verse 10. Isaiah writes, Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Merry Christmas. It's the uh, first week of December, and you can officially start saying that. All the people that I cursed for saying that in November, I apologize internally. But, uh, but that's on you. Um, I wanted to start today's message a little unorthodox. Um, I wanted to give a brief report of the trip that we took to Mexico. We thought this would be the best venue rather than holding a special meeting or asking you to leave your families during the holidays to come out for a different time. But our team uh, successfully was able to go to Mexico and everybody came back very healthy. Praise God. Um, yeah, amen. That's, that's, that's a serious prayer when we go down there. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to, to communicate to you the blessings. We were able to work with a group of pastors and leaders in the church, about 20 in all, uh, of whom we, we worked with last year as well, and to watch, to watch the growth and development in these leaders as they, and, and this is the thing, as they're prioritizing, maybe for the first time in their ministries, prioritizing the word of God above everything else. They're beginning to stand on his word and see it as the authority for their ministry, for their teaching, for everything they're doing. We've had the blessing of teaching multiple modules. They're in a three-year, nine-module seminary that we've developed in uh, Pachutla, Mexico. And uh, pastors from all over the Oaxaca region come and they meet for an entire week and, or four days of the week to do four days of intensive teaching and, uh, and learning. And they go through nine different modules and then different teaching each month. And then at the end of three years, which will end in March of this next year, uh, they'll get a certificate of completion. And uh, we're excited about the future of working with these pastors, seeing them move on to the next level and, and eventually leading the seminary themselves and teaching the topics and the modules that we're, we're teaching. It's just a great, to see the explosion of the the primacy of the Word of God in that region is just amazing. So thank you because your prayers were felt every day uh, for energy, strength, and, uh, and the, the power of the Spirit. We also thank you for those of you who, who partnered with us financially to go. We were able to blaze, bless the church and bless the ministry that's happening over there. So we want to thank you so much. There's a, a, a larger report that's coming in the newsletter and uh, by email to you. So please take some time to read that, and I'm happy to talk with any of you about the wonderful ministry that's happening over there. Maybe even take you with me one time to Mexico. Everybody, not all at once. Calm down. Let's pray as we enter our text today. Father, we do thank you that today is the first day of Advent, that our hearts are preparing the readiness for the coming of your son, your baby boy, our Savior, our King. And Lord, today we ask that your Spirit do a work in us that prepares us in an appropriate way to teach our children, to teach our family, to teach one another about the true expectation of the King. So we lift you up this morning and ask for you to be honored in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, Advent is here, the first of four Sundays uh, as we lead to the birth of Christ. And Advent comes from a, a Latin word that simply means coming, the coming of something, the advent of something. In this case, it's the advent of Christ. And I'd like to remove tension for the next four weeks of sermons, if I can do that for you. I'm not ruining any sermons. But I'd like to to remove tension in telling you that this is what it is all for. We spent from June all the way until last week in the Old Testament We spent our time in the prophets and in our time in Nehemiah, who is the foundation. And I want you to know that these four weeks are what it's all about. The foundation that was built, the fingers that are pointed, the promises that elevate all of the things that lift up the birth of our Savior. Just so you know, that's where I'm going for the next four weeks. We can go home. Now, the, the reality is when we think of Advent, when we think of the coming, we think excitement, expectation. We've actually titled this series for Advent, Expectations. And so the expectation, and in my house, if you get around this season, you can expect to have some expectations put on, well, put on you and also uh, enjoying. You know, I'm the type of person my wife and I have an ongoing argument, and yes, we fight. If you can't handle that from your pastor, I'm sorry. But we have this ongoing argument where, um, in my mind, nothing Christmas should happen until December 1st. Okay, that, that's, amen. Whoever, you, you, we got a club if you'd like to join. Um, but nothing should happen Christmas until December 1st. We, we should have 11 months uh, other than the gospel, we should have 11 months of, of, of regular year and then a one month of all the red, greens, and trees and, and Santa Clauses. Um, that, that stuff is just, it's everywhere, and our society just throws it up on everything. So I try to keep it out of my house until December 1st, right? The problem is the past several years, I've been going to Mexico in November. And so when I come home, she's like, well, you weren't here to tell me no, you know? So... My wife is the type of person that starts planning Christmas in June. So she's already thinking it's her favorite time of year, the celebration, every, the joy and everything that comes with it. And if you talk to my kids, they have this overwhelming expectation and excitement of the advent of Christmas. Maybe not, maybe not like holy for the sake of the gospel. Maybe there are other reasons. Uh, for instance, my youngest goes through the, the store with my wife. When my wife is, you, you know, it annoys her when she's just trying to go pick up one thing and you take a kid with you, you do your best to avoid the toy aisle. The problem is, is that they put the toy aisle on the end because they know what's going to happen. And so as you walk by, my son is going, mommy, buy me that. Mommy, buy me that. Mommy, buy me that. And she's going, no, I'm not buying you anything. And so the term started becoming, mommy, put that on my Christmas list. Mommy, put that on my Christmas list. I want that on my Christmas list. And my wife had this running checklist in her head of the Christmas list of our kids. There's, there's all of this expectation in our home for this season, for this, this Christmas day to arrive. We've got little uh, Advent calendars and little mouse and pockets and all kinds of fun things to celebrate this time. However, when we talk about expectations in Advent through this series... It's more than just excitement. It's a, it, it, the New Testament expectation was, it was prepared by a story. A story of even suffering and oppression, but yet combined with hope and prophecy. You see, expectation is larger. It's anyone who had lived in the midst of the redemptive narrative could not help but to have an expectation that was bursting forth for what God is about to do and what he's about to do next. Our hope in this series, the next four weeks, is that we start understanding, peering into the world of the expectation of the first century, that our hearts might come alive and that the meaning of this Christmas, the meaning of the birth of this Son of God would grow in us because of the expectation of the text. We ended our series last week in Nehemiah in chapter 13 with Nehemiah praying, God, please just remember me. 
We don't know where you are, but remember me. And that was the narrative end of the Old Testament. Now there's 400 years approximately between that and the beginning of the New Testament. And we call that 400 years the 400 years of silence because there was no new prophecy. There was no new scripture being written during that time. So we call it the 400 years of silence, but make no mistake, it was not silent. That 400 years carries some of the greatest events in history. For instance, Alexander the Great taking this, the world by storm in the 330 BCs. He was, he was uh, one of the quickest to cover the entire world and to dominate it. And at the end of his life, which was like 30-something years old, younger than me, after he conquered everything, he got sick. And he, he died on his deathbed. And he told his generals, may the strongest rule Greece, the Greek Empire. And so they all started submitting to one another, right? No not generals of an army. They started fighting one another. So the world was split into four sections with warlords, these generals, fighting. In all of this history, I, I've got to calm down the history. The early service told me I went a little far. But I, I get excited. But this history begins preparing the hope and the expectation of the New Testament. Because what happened is a king in the, in the Babylonia region where modern-day Iraq is, the, the Greek king that was there, they were named the Seleucid Empire. And the, the, the general who was over Egypt became the king of Egypt, and that became the Ptolemy Empire, okay? These two kings continued to fight one another for dominance, and right in between their two empires, can you guess what's there? Jerusalem, Canaan. That battle raged for years and years and years, and the victim were the Jews. As they weren't their own nation, at one time they were subject to the king of the north because he was stronger that year. And the next time they were subject to king of the south because he had pushed the king of the north out. And then not long after that, he came down. They never knew what was next. They didn't know who their kids would be serving or what king or what ruler it was a world filled with uncertainty and struggle. As a matter of fact, you can see the story, expectations here. You can see the story in 2 Maccabees, which is not a, 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 a book in the Bible. So if you go looking for it, unless you have the Apocrypha, you're not going to have it. But there's this story in 2 Maccabees that talks about this time period and talks about this king that rose up in this time period named Antiochus IV that was an evil king of the Seleucid Empire. And it says about the same time Antiochus prepared his second voyage into Egypt and then it happened that through all the city for the space almost of 40 days there were seen horsemen running in the air in cloth of gold and armed with lances like a band of soldiers and troops of horsemen in array encountering and running one against another with shaking of shields and multitude of pikes. Just this destruction on the city. This story is actually a neat story. This crazy king rises up in the Seleucid Empire named Antiochus IV, and he named himself Antiochus Epiphanes, which literally is, I'm naming myself God, okay? I am the epiphany of God here. The era, anyway, that's, that's his thing, is that he's Antiochus Epiphanes, and this is his picture here, and he is so bold to call himself God that he truly thinks of himself that way. His father was defeated by the rising empire Rome, which isn't dominant world yet, but rising empire Rome. But he prided himself as this great warlord and he was coming down to defeat Ptolemy empire for final time. He finally had enough strength to defeat the Ptolemaic empire. And on his way down, there was a problem. After he passed through Canaan and he gets to the border of Egypt, the problem is, is that the Ptolemies had an alliance with Rome because all Rome's grain came from Egypt, right? And so they had an alliance with Rome, and so he met on his way down a Roman general named Pompey. And this general said to him, not the one you know, this general said to him, the problem is if you go on to fight these guys, you'll be waging war against Rome, and I'll have to come after you. And I will destroy you. Um, and Antiochus, he says, if you turn away now, I'll let you leave, and we, our nations won't be at war. And Antiochus, because he knows the power of Rome, and yet he fancies himself a god, really had a conundrum at his, at his, at his, in front of him. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take some time to think about this. 
Pompey took a sword and drew a circle around him. He said, I tell you what, why don't you think about it right now? And by the time you step out of this circle, I expect your decision. And so Antiochus begrudgingly left humiliated and turning his back and walking away because he didn't want to fight Rome. With his tail between his legs, he headed back to his empire. But guess where he had to go first? Jerusalem. And he needed to punish somebody. So he went into Jerusalem, and it was one of the worst massacres as he came back from being defeated there in Egypt. One of the worst massacres as he walked in and he tore apart the city, tore apart the temple, and said, you will no longer worship this silly God of the Jews. You will worship the Greek gods. You will worship me. And he went through the city destroying all of them. You might be saying, Joseph, how is this building expectation? This sounds like it's destroying all hope, right? Right? except for the fact that Scripture itself spoke specifically about this. And the hope was is that this is still in God's redemptive plan. Look at Daniel 11 and what it says. At the time appointed, he, being Antiochus Epiphanes, shall return and come into the south, but it shall not be this time as it was before, for ships of Kittim, which are Rome, by the way, shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the holy covenant he shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the holy covenant forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offerings and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate the abomination of desolation this is when Antiochus Epiphanes takes a pig and sacrifices it on the altar of the holy of holies in the 160s BC. And this incited a revolt. Do you scholars know which revolt this is? The Maccabean revolt. Maccabees rise up and they revolt against this king Antiochus and they conquer, they cast him out and they conquer the city and they finally rule for the first time and the people knowing this Daniel prophecy and seeing that for the first time since before the exile we actually have a king ourselves of this city they said it must be happening all that God is going to do must be happening but the truth is is they could conquer the Greeks army out of Jerusalem but they couldn't conquer Greek culture And eventually those kings became more Greek and more Greek and more Greek and they left the the law of God behind and began serving the world and eventually Rome came in and defeated and Israel had an overlord again. And at this time the Jews had mentally and emotionally had enough. It was time for God to come in and do what they knew he was going to do. They were sick of it by the time first century comes around. Let me ask a question. Okay, here's a question I want to ask is that the Jews are putting all of this out on God. They're waiting and they're looking toward God to do all of this stuff. But why would God do anything? Why would God show up? What does God owe these people? You might have a good answer to that. You might say he shows up, he might do something because he promised to do so. Because of the prophecies like we read today, I'm going to, a uh, son will be born, uh, 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 his name will be Emmanuel to a virgin. That, that these are the reasons why God is going to show up. And you know what? That's a great answer. I'd agree with you 100%. But you know, a promise and a prophecy is only as good as your experience with the source. Do you know what I'm saying? Let me put it this way. If I have, I, I do have some friends, whether you believe it or not, I have some friends And I've got some friends that if they tell me, I'm going to meet you for lunch and I'm going to be there at 12 o'clock. Okay? 11.45, I can guarantee they're going to be there. Like, take it to the bank. They're that type of person. And after that experience, I will show up at almost 11.45 beforehand to make sure we meet. I have some friends, not naming any names, who when they said, I'll be here at noon, I don't even bother showing up until 12.30. Okay? Because, Because it's not happening. My experience with, with the consistency of, of the ability to fulfill promises is dependent on my experience with how much that source has provided. And so God's promises and God's prophecies have to be built on an experience with his ability to fulfill them, right? 
And so when we look at the text, I think the thing that will help us understand why the expectation is so strong in the first century is to compare two captivities in the text of Scripture. The first captivity is the captivity, well, I mean, I say the first one we're going to talk about, is the captivity of the exile, the one they're currently in. Okay, we said at the end of Nehemiah that they're not out of exile. God is still not present, and so they're not out of exile. They're still in exile in their captivity. They're, they're, they're in the land of, of Persia and Babylon. But the first captivity is what? Egypt, right? That's, these are the two parallels that I think will help us. You see, when the Jews have expectation for all that God is going to do, it's based on what God has already done. And so when we look at these two, two, two captivities, what you'll see is a parallel, a rhythm that the Jews are experiencing that help us understand the expectation for this, this son to be born. These are the two ca- captivities. The first thing is that they're ruled by foreign kings. This is self-explanatory. But this speaks against the covenant that God made with Abraham, right? He said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a what? A great nation. Okay, but no great nation is conquered and ruled by foreign kings. That's not called a great nation. That's called a weak nation that got conquered by foreign kings. Okay, so both of these exiles are example of them not being a great nation and being ruled by foreign Gentile uh, kings, heathen kings. And so the the first being Egypt and the second being Persia. I didn't put any verses up there because I figured that was fairly self-explanatory. Okay, how about the second one? Listen to this. The second rhythm of this is that the people cry out for God's favor and deliverance. In both narratives, in both captivities, the people cry out for God to be faithful to his covenant and and to deliver them. Okay, this one in Exodus 3 says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. We know this story, how God heard their cry and he chose to deliver them, right? And then we see in the text of Nehemiah, which I'm not going to go fully into because we just did 13 weeks in this book. But it says, uh, uh, one of my brothers came with certain men from Judah and asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed. And then we see Nehemiah go into a prayer of crying out, God, would you be faithful to your covenant? Would you remember your people? Will you deliver us? from this captivity. And so the Jews are saying, all right, two, we got two of them, right? The first one, the second one, we're, we're, in, we're in parallel now, we're running, okay? The third one, how about this? That God's sovereignty over foreign powers, that God proves his sovereignty over foreign powers. And we see this in both captivity narratives. The first one is easy, We see in Exodus 7, the beginning of the 10 plagues says, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts and the people and the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. And the Egyptians shall know, listen to this, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel among them. This is, this is powerful here. When you see this story in the book of, of, uh, of Exodus, when you see this narrative, I want you to understand this isn't just a punishment on Egypt, even though that's what God says to do. He's going to punish them. It is, but it's not just a punishment. This is a battle in ancient areas. This is a battle between the gods. Pharaoh is considered demigod. He's considered God, the, the god Ra and the, and the Egyptian gods. They're man on earth, Right? He's considered their their representative. And then here you have Moses, the humble servant of the true God of Israel. And they're going head to head. And and God sends the 10 plagues against Egypt. And at the end of that whole narrative, you're going, where in the world were the gods of Egypt? They didn't even show up. Later we know because they're not real. But we know that in this narrative, God definitively shows that he is sovereign over all nations, all kings, all gods. There is no God like him, and no kingdom rises or, or falls without him. He is in charge of everything. And that's just the way it is. We see that in the, the second captivity, the same thing. 
This is how Ezra begins. It says, thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, the heathen king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. This is, this is the way this works is that he says, he says, God, th this is the rhythm is that God is sovereign over all kings. And even in the second exile, in the second uh, captivity, God proves that these kings, he prophesied through Isaiah, these kings are subject to me. They're just my pawns. He's sovereign over everything. But see, this is the problem, is that they're parallel up to that point in their rhythm and their cycle, and things going. And so that builds for the Jews, they're expecting what's next. And what does come next in the cycle of captivity? The, in, in the, in the Egyptian captivity, the Israelites are paraded through the Red Sea, right? And then that Exodus 19, 20 narrative, they come to Mount Sinai, and what happens at Mount Sinai? The fire comes down to scorch the mountain in the presence of God. The very presence of God comes down in the midst of Israel and remains, listen to this, he goes with them. He remains with them and they go and they experience all the blessings, they experience all the good things of being in the presence of God. And that's where the cycle breaks. Because as we read last week, the Jews had done everything to match that cycle. And then at the end, Nehemiah cries out and goes, God, why aren't you here? Just remember me. I don't know what's going on. You should have come down by now. But he doesn't. He doesn't. And this is where our text today in Isaiah 7 really elevates this prophecy because God has already done it once for God to promise that he is going to send a son born of a virgin and his name is going to be what? Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. That, that's the promise that the Jews and the expectation of the entire Advent hope of this birth of this baby boy, the Jews are looking forward to saying, when is God going to be with us again? Because that's the completion of the cycle. And doesn't that just make it that much more powerful? In Matthew chapter one, when Matthew cries out, the book of genealogy that Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the two great hopes of the Old Testament is here. Oh, and by the way, just so you know, that cycle of exile, it's over. It's over because all of this uh, took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew wants to make sure you get it, which means God with us. Guys, everything you've been hoping for, everything you've been waiting for, the cycle's complete in Christ. And it's done there are no more cycles. It is complete and it is finished in the birth of this baby boy who comes in four weeks. The birth of this son. It is done. This is the hope. This explains the tenseness of the expectation of the New Testament world. You see, there expectation is, goes beyond just excitement. Their expectation is the faith and the belief in a good God who has proven to be true to his promises and his covenant, who has proven to be able to fulfill all hope and all prophecy, and yet clashing with the detriment of their reality, of their situation that they are still in exile and still ruled by an overlord Rome. That's the heart and the foundation of the expectation in the New Testament. This anxiety that comes with waiting on God to move when you've suffered so much, knowing that he's good. So it leads us to a second question. All right, the second question is this. If this expectation were so clear, if this cycle were so clear and so ready and they were waiting for the cycle to finish, then why did so many in the first century of the people of God miss 
the Messiah. Have you ever wondered that? If Jesus fulfills everything of the Old Testament, if Christ is the answer to all the hope of the text of Scripture, then why was it not more clear? Why did the first century Jews miss the coming of the great Messiah prophesied in the text of Scripture? I'd like to think that if I lived back then, this is my arrogance and play for you, I'd like to think that if I lived back then, I'd be like, man, you guys are stupid. This is, this is the Son of God over here. But we don't get to do that. We've got to ask some critical hard questions and identify probably with the dumber people, which is what I do uh, in this case. But we need to ask some hard questions. If that's the case, then my answer for you today is this, and I want to unpack it for you, is that the reason so many missed the coming of the Messiah, the promised one, is this, that their, ex their expectations were based on their circumstances and not the character of God. Let me, let me help you unpack that when I say this. And, and, and it fits in the comparison of the two, uh, of the two uh, captivity narratives, okay? Except for it leans on what's different in the two rather than what's same in the two, okay? So here's what I'm going to say. The first thing is this. Let's, uh, let's talk about the circumstances, that those whose expectations were based on circumstances. We know the circumstances surrounding the second exile, the, second, the one that they're still in. Uh, up to the point of Christ. We know why they're in that exile. Why are they there? Because of their disobedience to the law of God, right? That's the reason in Ezekiel 10, we see the presence of God leave the temple and God puts them in exile. That's what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter five. He says, therefore my people go into exile for lack of knowledge, which Isaiah's phrase of saying, they don't know me. It means they're, don't, they're not obedient to me. They're not following me. They don't know me. And that's why they're going into exile. And so we see that, that this exile, this, this captivity is, is serves as a discipline of God's people, right? Well, the mind of a human is fairly predictable on some level. Like take, for instance, my children. When my children do something wrong or break a rule in my house, they get disciplined, okay? That's, that's the way we work in our house, a loving discipline. And we discipline for correction, right? And so when we discipline, my children go through a natural logical process of saying, whatever caused this to happen, I never want to do it again. Or take it a little bit further, whatever, whatever I did to get in this situation, I will do the opposite to get out of it, right? That's natural logic, and it's the same logic that plays out here, but I want you to listen how it comes out, okay? If disobedience is the way that we got into exile, if disobedience is the way that we lost the presence of God, if disobedience is the cause for this captivity, then our stringent obedience to the law is how we're going to get out of it. Does it, it sounds logical when you're talking about a kid, but all of a sudden when you're talking about the Bible, you go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound right, but don't, before you get too close to judging these guys and those Pharisees in the New Testament, you need to follow logic because I'm right there. But the reality is, is this is what happens. They start saying, uh, and they start, they start elevating the law. And they start saying, if the law was the reason that we're in this, then stringent and, and, and legalistic obedience to the law is what is going to get us out of it. Now, they knew that the cycle wasn't complete until what? Until God was with them, right? Until God's presence came down and met them. And they, they, they began to start thinking, well, how do we make that happen? Listen to that. How do we make that happen? By being strict, obedient to the law. There's so much danger in this. It has a way of distorting our expectations, there's so much danger in the way, that we, the way that we talk about this. And so even though obedience to the law is actually a really good thing, obedience to the law is a good thing, it can actually distort our expectation. The danger ultimately at the, at the bottom of it is that we reduce God to an equation. That if I A and you B, then God has to C, right? Right? We come to the false logic that the way I live my life or my obedience or the way that I do things can compel or invoke God to do things 
that they can make it happen. Right? That there's some sequence of events that is going to cause it to come down because we saw it happen before. If we just mimic that stuff, then we will have the presence of God fall on us. It's like technology. I curse technology. All technology. There was a time a while ago where I was like technology. I had it all down. I was the lead technology of this church, by the way. Anything you saw up on the screens, these speakers, all nine years, I installed it all. I did all of that. But when I took the lead position here as pastor, in the job description, it says you must become stupid with all technology because that's exactly what happened. Now I don't even know how to turn my computer on. Like, like Matthew will come to me and I'll say, Matthew, I want to do this. And Matthew comes to me and says, if you want that to happen, you have to do this, do this, do this, then do that, and then do this. And then it, and it happens. I go, okay, that's easy enough. A week later, I go to do it. And I start doing it. And I do all the things in my mind that he told me to do. And it's not doing it. And I want it to be the, the thing's fault. So I call Matthew and I go, Matthew, your stupid thing you gave me isn't working. And, and in his infinite grace, he goes, oh, yeah, I guess that, yeah, that's possible. Sure, sure, sure. So, so how are you trying to do it? I'm like, no, I'm telling you, I'm doing exactly the way you told me to do it, and it's not working. So Matthew comes over, and literally, he goes, show me what you're doing, and I do it, and he reaches and touches one button, and it all works. <laughs> oh, you know, just, just the worst ever. But the truth is, is that is sometimes the, the procedure or the logic that we reduce our relationship to God, to God with. We say, I can compel God to accomplish something. I just need to go through the right procedures, the right sequences. And if it didn't happen, it must be a button I didn't push. It must be something I didn't do. And that's exactly what the Jews were doing. We did everything right and God didn't come back and fire and fill the temple with his holy presence and destroy everybody else and establish his kingdom, in heaven, uh, kingdom on earth. That We must have not pushed a button. And for them, they said that button is the law. And out of that, in, the, in that intertestamental period, rose a group in Jerusalem, a, a group in Israel known as the Pharisees. The very group that we, we roll our eyes at and scorn and scoff, but make no mistake, they're functioning logically. They come up out of that and they say, if we can, if we can script obedience to a T to tell you exactly what you can do and exactly what you can't do and get everybody to follow that, then God will have no choice but to come back and to be with us. And that logic always has a weird group that splits off from it. You know, so there was this other group called the Sakari that split off from it and they were zealots. And let me tell you, their logical thinking. They would walk around with a knife under their coat and they would stab Romans. They were terrorists. They'd stab Romans or they'd stab Roman empathizers and they'd yell out, no king but God, and they'd run away. And no, you, you laugh, but their logic was if we can incite a rebellion, a holy rebellion out of obedience and Rome comes down on Israel, God in his goodness would have no choice but to rise up and defend his people. I don't want to be a part of that group. But that's, that's the logic that happens. And before you get too giggly, note that we do this all the time. We often reduce God to some lucky rabbit's foot or we reduce the power of the cross in Christ to something that fits in our pocket. We say, you know what? I wanted God to do this, but I just didn't pray enough. Like you didn't push some button in the sequence. Oh, I missed two of my devotions this week, so I'm really not feeling the blessings of God. What? He sent his son. You mean you don't feel the blessings of God? Wake up every day. I don't care what the circumstances are around you. Wake up every day and feel the blessings of God, please. But we live our lives acting as if, if we A and B, then God is required to do C for us. And guys, that's building our expectations around our circumstances. Not building our, our expectations on the character of God. You see, if you compare the two stories the two captivities, what you'll notice is that you can't do that across the board for both of them. 
We know the circumstances surrounding the second one is disobedience to the law. But tell me, why were the first Jews captive in Egypt? Was it because they were disobedient and God was punishing them? No. If you don't know that, I'm telling you no. Is it because God chose to use Pharaoh to teach the Israelites a lesson? No. Do you want to hear what Scripture says is the reason they're going to spend 400 years suffering at the hand of Egypt? I'll, I'll plan some time for counseling in my office this week because this might rock a little bit of your theology. Listen to this. In, X, in Genesis 15, when he's giving the promise to Abraham about his children, he says, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. God's predicting this. This is going to happen, Abraham. Then he tells him why. Listen to the reason. Okay? But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. We know that happened. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquities. For is the reason. That's the cause. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. God's people are going to suffer for 400 years in captivity in Egypt because God's doing something with somebody else and he's telling them to shut up and wait? Wow. How, how do you square that? You have to realize that God is sovereign. You have to realize that God's first priority in our lives and on this earth is his redemptive purposes, not my well-being or yours. doesn't mean he doesn't care about our well-being. It just means his first priority is his redemptive purposes. And if he's doing something with another group of people and he tells the Israelites, you'll be fine, just wait there and suffer until I'm done, you have, we have to deal with that. God is God. And his redemptive purposes are the top, the, 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 the head of all things. And what he does when he decides, when he hears their cry and decides to deliver them, it's a deliverance not because they finally were perfectly obedient. It's not because they compelled or invoked him to move. It's not because of something like that. It's because his time was right. His, his glory was, was uh, at, the, at the helm. And ultimately, it was an act of pure grace that he chose to show up, deliver the people, and defeat Pharaoh. And make no mistake, the story of the coming Messiah is no different. God is not compelled or invoked to send his son in flesh. It was always the plan. It was always his redemptive purpose, and it was in his timing and a full act of grace that he chose. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. This Advent season, our expectations based on the character of God are fully surrounded by his grace. We are expecting his grace to move in the birth of his son. And as you go back to your family, as you think about your life, as you work with your, your, the people around you and you talk about expectations and you say, I want to be clear about something. It's not A and B it compels God to do C. It's that God sent his son as an act of grace in his timing for his purposes, for his glory, and he chose as a free gift to give righteousness through the cross to you and to me. And we get to begin our celebration of Christmas with that expectation filling our homes. And today, today if you are still in exile, Today, if this captivity hasn't completed itself and God is not with you, if God is far from you, or maybe you're saying, you know what, I've been living my life like God is an equation. That's all I've learned. That's all I've known. That's all I've been taught. I invite you, would you come know him this season, this Advent, would expectations explode into you where you cannot help but to know 
him for who he really is and experience his full grace this Christmas season. Because he sent in an infant a baby's flesh, he sent perfect obedience to the law. In baby's flesh, he sent a perfect sacrifice. He sent salvation and redemption. He sent our return from exile to be with him. As I invite our worship team up to close us with a chorus, shall we pray? And shall we invite Christ to our homes in our hearts this season? Father, we pray with expectation. Expectation of your grace, knowing that it's your move in our hearts and in our lives. And Father, we, we, we praise you that you chose to move by sending your Son. And today we celebrate thanking you for that move, living in the pleasure of your redemptive work. We ask for you to build the Advent in our homes with our families this season that we may lean fully on you. In Jesus' name, amen.